This episode is supported by TeamDrive, the enterprise and personal file synchronization and sharing solution that is secure and protects your privacy. To learn more, visit teamdrive.com or if you are from US, visit syncion.com. S-Y-N-Q-I-O-N.com. You will get 15% discount on the first year subscription if you use coupon code GADA15, G-A-D-A-1-5. This episode is supported by Tutanota, the secure Gmail replacement. I use Tutanota because it respects my privacy and keeps my data secure. As Tutanota is ad-free, the team asked me to keep this ad short. So let's start with the real thing. To know more, visit tutanota.com. In the first part of this episode, I introduced Johannes Kastner, CEO and founder of Collectivewise. He talked about the purpose of the project and the benefits of collective intelligence over artificial intelligence. In this part, I'm going to move the conversation towards more practical aspects of the project, asking him about the application domains where CollectiveWise can play a role, and of course the technologies the team is using to implement such a complex and ambitious project. This is Data Science at Home the podcast that makes machine learning and artificial intelligence easy for everyone. Here's your host, Francesco Garaletta. Well, moving the conversation towards more practical aspects of this project, what technologies are involved with uh, uh, the platform CollectiveWise? At the center of CollectiveWise, we start with our own Git branch of OpenCog from the OpenCog Foundation, which is an open source implementation of Cog Prime. Uh, that's uh, Ben Gertzel's and many others path to artificial intelligence. We then combine this with open source blockchain code to create the glue that turns the reasoning of the many into the reasoning of the collective self, while preserving each individual's reasoning as an inspectable and visualizable map of the world. So you can browse to other people's profiles and look at their maps of decision environment, where the map includes as much as possible of the procedures, goals, and ethical logic that the individual comes to through careful social reflection. So our income and thus dynamically her power to affect the decisions of the collective in the future depend directly on her system of statements in a way such that she is incentivized to contribute as much as possible to the wisdom of the collective and thus to learn as much as possible from every failure and from every success with respect to her predictions and goal setting. Uh, as an aside, by the way, the uh, open source movement with all of its tools, such as Git, is itself, of course, a form of collective intelligence. And thus building everything on the shoulders of open source giants is very much in the spirit of our mission. We're, we're here to help and synergize and to propose adjustments to our game we're involved in, such as to make them win-win. The genius of Ben Gertzel's system, to get back to that, it's a data structure called a hypergraph. It allows for what Ben Gertzel calls the cognitive synergy. Not to be confused with collective synergy, which is the term I use when many individuals can reach some state of knowledge or solve some puzzle that eludes the cleverest and wisest individual among them. Cognitive synergy, on the other hand, is, and I'm quoting Gertzel now, the, the fitting together of different intelligent components into an appropriate cognitive architecture in such a way that the components richly and dynamically support and assist each other, interrelating very closely in a similar manner to the components of the brain or body, and that's giving rise to appropriate emergent structures and dynamics. An analogous concept is ethical synergy, which Cog Prime develops along with cognitive synergy. In the Cog Prime system, then, all of these dis- disparate but Related forms of logic and algorithms can be expressed through the use of structures known in mathematics as hypergraph. In COG Prime and its implementation, open COG Prime, cognitive processes interact with each other. We are, common acting, uh, we are commonly acting on the atom space knowledge repository, which, and now I'm, I'm quoting the GitHub page, is a knowledge representation database and the associated query reasoning engine to fetch and manipulate that data and perform reasoning on it. Data is represented in the form of graphs and more generally as hypergraphs, 
is the atom space is a kind of graph database. The query engine is a general graph free writing system. And the rule engine is a generalized rule driven inferencing system. The vertices and edges of a graph, known as atoms, are used to represent not only data, but also procedures. But many graphs are executable programs as well as data structures. Okay, so uh, the hypergraph, which is a known concept to mathematicians and, and of course computer scientists is a structure a complex data structure to manage knowledge now what is the role played by blockchain technology the heart of the system then right it's then combined with the blockchain to incentivize individuals to contribute to the collective calculation of probabilities and attention values they collectively discover and formulate the important nodes the nodes are then uh, are, they, they can be procedures, events, or relationships between events, and relationships between events and other events, as well as the relationship between relevant events and actors in the system and relationships between the actors, etc. You get the idea. All sorts of ontological knowledge, as well as logic. Here, logic is defined in a much broader sense than what people may expect from their understanding of oppositional logic, for instance. And it includes various models such as procedural reasoning, causal reasoning, reasoning about internal states and mental structures of the self and other actors, as well as the collective self. Our prime, primary tool for handling declarative knowledge is an uncertain inference framework called probabilistic logic networks, PLN. PLN combines certain term logic rules with standard predicate logic rules and utilizes both fuzzy truth values and a variant of imprecise probabilities that's called the indefinite probabilities. PLN's mathematics dictates how these uncertain truth values then propagate through the logic rules so that uncertain premises give rise to conclusions with reasonable, accurate estimates of uncertainty values. This sounds to me a bit like um, you know something that can be achieved by uh, Bayesian probability with uh, uninformative priors, or am I on a different page? Well, some simple uncertainty for predictions can take such forms in the system, but flat priors are not generally applicable concepts in the real world. They, they refer to priors about categories or values that certain variables will take on, uh, potentially hyperparameters. They are, there is a description of maximal uncertainty in the coin toss, for example, but that's only true if you believe with certainty that the coin is actually fair. So, in other words, that the coin is 50-50. So that's a flat tire. So, so, however, you cannot express something even as simple as, I am not sure if this coin is fair. And if, uh, you know, and if not, I'm not sure at all what, what it is bias. In terms of simple flat priors, you cannot express this much less. Something about the existence and influence. I'm, I'm not... You know, so for example, take a sentence like, I'm not sure that Johnny hasn't influenced her on her opinion that there exists a spy in our group. That English sentence couldn't be expressed in terms of variables and priors in the usual sense. But it can nevertheless be expressed in an exact and computer understandable way. In fact, open cog can learn how to translate this English sentence in its own, on its own into a symbolic, precise, and correct form in what is called the atom space. Whenever there's something unsure, we understand there to be some probability value attached to some structure, but we have no clue at all what that value might be. Markets can often, oftentimes reduce the uncertainty by a lot, but sometimes there's still some remaining uncertainty that needs to be precisely quantified. A flat prior her belief that there is a spy in our group would amount to saying something like a 50-50 belief that there's a spy in our group. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that saying I'm not sure isn't the same as saying 50-50. But it's generally meant by flat priors is self-debatable. And Gary King has written some insightful article about, articles several, about how flat priors don't really express maximum uncertainty in most reasonable cases. Yeah, but, What's more important to remember about our system is uh, it's really different. It's that 
it's chaining together various probabilistic and deterministic statements of various logical types into a map. Not generally a chain, but but a hypergraph. Wherever there are any observations made within the system, the probabilities and thus the values of all statements in monetary terms through some token propagate through the system and are affected by evidence automatically. This happens in more or less the same way as it would through a Bayesian network, if you are more familiar with that idea. The atom space can in some way be thought of as a, as a vast generalization of probabilistic graphical models, where, where all sorts of logic, ontological statements and processes can be expressed in the same structure, conditional probabilities of events, as would be common in Bayesian networks. It is a probabilistic graphical model of a sort, but it's a hypergraph, allowing for more general edges and no types. So then, called Prime's TLN econ based framework, which is, you know, this is sort of an economic attention allocation framework for handling intentional knowledge, is used to handle goals by representing them declaratively and allocating attention among them economically through something like markets. Even, even in, the, you know, Cork, in the open Cork system, there are simulated markets, so we're turning them into actual markets. Collectivize extends this idea, basically, by incentivizing all members of a collective to declare what they see as the best probabilistic goal hierarchy of the organization. They, they do this by committing resources to them in, in ways that rewards individuals to allocate their attention economically. By complex goals, what is meant is a system of collectively negotiated metrics and their interrelations. Collectivize is developed using a combination of theory, experiment, and intuition. And what we're ultimately trying to build is a laboratory for scientific and engineering explorations around intelligence and wisdom on scales from the individual to large organizations, building on ideas from many disciplines. Open COG and blockchain smart contracts are the building blocks that we start with and that we seek to stretch in yet unforeseeable ways. Well, many pioneers claim that uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence is not reachable with the current technology. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate uh, here. How can you transition from a uh, not feasible technology like AGI to uh, what you are declaring here, the CGI or cognitive general intelligence? Cop Prime is an integrative AGI architecture. Uh, it's the first of its kind. It, it rests on the fundamental principle of general intelligence called cognitive synergy. It doesn't play a central role in narrow AI systems of the kind developed for usual data science purposes. All the current approaches, minus talk prime that I've come across, seem to miss this central point. Perhaps not because they don't understand the principles, but simply because they, they have narrower goals. They aren't in business to create human-level intelligence but to sell things and advertise things and to get you to click on links. That's one part of the answer. The other part is that general intelligence already exists in human beings, and Collectivize merely uses methods from the field of human-machine interaction and some AI glue to take advantage of collective synergy to produce even higher levels of cognitive synergy in ways to magnify the general intelligence and wisdom that exists within the humans to gamified and sustained collective radical self-improvement, where the self here refers to the identity not of any individuals, but to the collective self, one multi-organism intelligence. So let me quote from the book again, uh, Engineering Artificial Intelligence, which is uh, Ben Gertzel's work on which this uh, open source software system, as well as the theory that it is an impl uh, implementation of, is based. The central hypothesis underlying the Cog Prime approach to AGI is that the cognitive synergy and swings of integrating multiple symbolic and sub-symbolic learning and memory components in an appropriate cognitive architecture and environment can yield robust intelligence at the human level and ultimately beyond. Now, since from the perspective of collectivized, we already have human level intelligence and wisdom, we are mostly interested in achieving intelligence far beyond that of individuals. Note that in, in narrow cases, such that 
of simple prediction, this has long been achieved and demonstrated amply by prediction markets. But what the prediction markets achieve is highly specialized collective intelligence, analogous to the prediction of categories of objects by a deep neural net. So in, in the case of AI, this is narrow AI. And we thus can think of prediction markets as implementations of narrow co collective intelligence. And what we're interested in is uh, collective general intelligence, analogous to artificial general intelligence. So that, that allows a collective to analytically think in all ways that humans can, but, but much better because collective synergy is combined with cognitive synergy where diverse components of collective intelligence interact, basically. Let me give you another quote from engineering artificial intelligence, uh, artificial general intelligence. Here it goes. Making such diverse components work together in a truly synergetic and cooperative way is a tall order. Yet we believe that this, rather than some particular algorithm, structural or ar architectural principle, is the secret sauce needed to create human-level AGI based on technologies available today. Similarly, now, uh, for collective intelligence to be what we believe it could be, we must bring together a myriad of cognitive functions into one coherent architecture such that they can be crowdsourced interactively together in a system that enables synergies and learning between various specialized forms of logic and prediction tasks for maximal radical self-improvement. Again, of the self, that's the, the collective self, perhaps also of the individual self, but, but our interest is really is the collective self, the power of the crowd. Well, yeah, now that you explained how, uh, you know, what is the principle behind this, uh, you know, what you mentioned, the, the, what you call the secret source of intelligence, it makes sense indeed to refer to blockchain technology as the substrate that could allow, at least from an implementation perspective, uh, such a secret source. So can you please explain us uh, what would be the role played by blockchain technology? Sure. The, the blockchain is itself actually an application of collective intelligence. It is a self-policing system of connected users that eliminates the need for oversight. And in our system, it enables most instantaneously complex transactions between multiple to thousands of organization members. And it keeps track in a transparent way of all interactions and exchanges that together form the belief system and ethics of the collective self, that is the emergent organization. In such a system, all intermediaries, credit cards, banks, you know, are eliminated because participants can have valuable exchanges directly with each other. All accounting efforts are also eliminated because all participants have access to the shared ledger, which is self-auditing. Blockchain security features protect against tempering, fraud, and cybercrime. So if a, if a network is permissioned, as is the term, it enables the creation of a, of a member's only network with proof members are who they say they are and with proof that all value flows exactly as it is represented. It is easy for a user to customize which transaction details they want other participants to be permitted to view. In the, the collectivized system, all transactions are digital and the blockchain system was practically designed for such cases. So so-called smart contracts are then used to automatically regulate the interaction of all computing and cognitive components. For example, let's take the case of a combinatorial decision prediction market as a model. Suppose that we have two possible actions to take. To use solar panels or to burn coal, to heat up the water for the, the company shower, to take something extremely simple. Simplified, really. What, what, once one solution is installed, Let's assume that it is infeasible to reverse this decision later. So then we have a gasoline prices to consider and maybe some tax benefits for using solar, which then brings us very quickly into quite complex territory. It forces us to consider political events to forecast both tax benefits and gasoline prices, for instance. But at some point, we make the decision to choose, say, solar. The moment that we make that decision, Gasoline prices become completely irrelevant for all future decisions 
that are relevant to hot water showers and the compounding showers. Then the blockchain immediately knows to avoid all smart contracts that were based on the relationship between hot showers and gasoline prices. Technically, they are avoided not by erasing them, but, but by creating new contracts that nullify the old ones. But this is less important. Every transaction is recorded. It is never undone, really, except by the formulation of a new reverse contract. In any case, the whole system will be running on its own. and it does not need intervention. It enables an autonomous organization that regulates itself in clever ways that themselves can be manipulated so, by human scientists for research purposes and to improve, improve incentives, as well as by the AI scientists at the center. It is then later easy to debrief all members who have been part of each experiment and to, to do so credibly as every experimental lever is tracked by the ledger. This is desirable, as this so-called trustless system actually is expected to foster trust, ironically, with all participants and all parties involved. You know, once people are used to a world in which there is no fraud possible, their expectations of fraud is expected to drop, clearly, and people will feel safer and thus more open to each other. This is a hypothesis that, that hasn't been tested yet, but that I will test. In order to integrate OpenCog with the blockchain, we don't have to start from scratch, though. We can build on existing blockchain prediction markets, such as, in our case, we use the Bowie prediction market, which is a startup based in San Francisco, and, you know, they have a good-sized team that has already built most of the needed infrastructure. You know, it only needs to be customized to handle more more types of arguments. In particular, it needs to be customized so that it can uh, that it can express all of those arguments that are expressible through the open cog system. And uh, what is the state of the project? Like, um, is there any progress? Uh, what, what are the applications that you guys are? Uh, pretty much focused on? Will you start operating in one specific domain, uh, leaving others for future development, or are you starting broadly as a general concept? The state of the project will always be developing, which is part of the philosophy. But I think what you're asking is how far we are from being a viable company. And I would say that we hope to have our first contract and revenue coming in sometime between six months and a year from now. Right now, we're in an early enough state that it makes sense to pursue a few possible paths in parallel, and, and we're, doing, we're doing exactly that. I have a partner named Christina. She's applying for grants that would help us develop our platform in support of research grants. Another approach that we're pursuing is to, once we think that we can go into production, which is hopefully in a few months, approach fintech companies, finance companies, as well as biotech firms, we're willing to experiment with new communication tools for collaborative investment risk and reward assessments. Insurance companies also seem to be reasonable for customers. So we, we could just start having customers and then by using that revenue, building the company without really needing any VCs. In addition, we are, we're thinking to provide services for free to one or two selected nonprofit organizations and work with them in close synergy to develop a usable and user-friendly system that benefits those organizations as soon as possible. But the system is expected to be a bit buggy at first, of course. Sure. Um, well, this is a, a pretty much a speculation. Who do you expect is going to invest resources, uh, you know, even financial resources on collective-wise? And uh, as a second question, are there specific domains that you are tackling and that you think might be first movers uh, you already mentioned uh, insurance of course and finance uh, but i'm also thinking about healthcare uh, social media uh, hnr um, creating or changing existing jobs and stuff like that you know in the long run i'm envisioning i'm envisioning a future where smart collectives or really wise collectives are commonplace and where that's how people work in organizations how they collectively conduct their political activism and how they generally engage with each other. But uh, right now, there's a fear that AI will make humans as workers obsolete, right? So humans, as part of smart or wise collectives, can never 
in a sense, can never be obsolete, as intelligence in this form always increases if human members are added to the, to the system. And with greater wisdom, more can always be achieved. But, you know, in the beginning, so to get, you know, our, our customers will be likely uh, restricted to organizations where management already understands the benefits of prediction markets and existing models of collective intelligence, such as crowdsourcing, new product lines, etc. These are the sort of companies of which executives or research scientists and engineers regularly give talks at or show up to the, the yearly collective intelligence conference. Or, or related conference. This, this likely excludes Microsoft and Facebook, which have many people show up and give talks, but who likely prefer to build their, their systems internally. They always contribute some useful comments and critiques, though. But, but the kind of companies we're going after is one whose executives are interested in experimentation and who already know that there is something to this concept of collective intelligence that could benefit them. You'd be surprised how many people we have read works in the prediction market literature and how, how hot of a topic this is, for example, at Microsoft Research. Now, while uh, Microsoft Research can build its own internal prediction market and has profitably done so, uh, companies that are not in the software business might prefer to hire some other company to do this rather complex business for them. And, and why not one that has some additional ideas? Who are the pioneers in this field? Good question. So Thomas Malone, the director of MIT Center for Collective Intelligence just put out a new book called Supermind, The Surprising Power of People and Computers Thinking Together. That's likely going to make some waves. So, uh, and then uh, earlier was, uh, by, for example, by my advisor, Scott Page, whom I know from the Santa Fe Institute, and who is also a professor at Michigan University and was the director there of the Complex Systems Center. Yes written a major work on collective intelligence and team diversity called The Difference, How the Power of Diversity Creates Better Groups, Firms, Schools, and Society. It is fair to say that what I call collective synergy really comes from cognitive diversity, which is about the diversity of people's cognitive algorithms and perspectives, the way that they think differently from each other. And, and Scott Page was really one of the first to recognize that it isn't just about difference information that people are exposed to, but really about how their minds are wired differently, which is a, a much more profound understanding. In terms of companies, Microsoft Research, with researchers like David Rothschild and Duncan Ross, is a pioneering research organization that has probably contribute, contributed more, more to this emergent field than any other organization. Is there any reference that uh, you might um, um, advise, especially to beginners who can consult to get started with, uh, with uh, this topic? I'm about to write some related papers, but uh, nothing yet is written on this particular system, nor will it be for, for a little while. It is planned to be the center of much research, and then, then there will be much written about it. Until then... There is, there's a large body of literature centered on prediction markets, as I mentioned before, combinatorial prediction markets and decision markets by authors like Duncan Watts and David Rothschild, Robin Hanson, etc. cetera. And, and there is the work of Scott Page, whom I have mentioned before, who is on my committee and who wrote a book called The Difference. There's also the popular book called The Wisdom of the Crowd by James Sor Sorowicki for less technical readers who seek a, a broad perspective on the motivation, the, the motivating factors of collective life. The, the classical literature starts with Aristotle, who discussed democracy as a collective intelligence where, wherein, through constant public debate, eventually a will and ethics of the people emerge. Ibn Khaldun, in the 14th century, was a pioneering historic, historian, economist, and sociologist. And, and he formulated theories of group cohesion and consciousness that build on Aristotle's earlier work. The first mathematical model of collective intelligence came to my knowledge from Marquis de Condorcet, who was an 18th century mathematician and philosopher who had a model named the Condorcet Jury Theorem, which took a first formal mathematical crack at the phenomenon of why it is that groups often, definitely not always, perform better than the brightest individual. The model was really not at all about groups or the people, but 
So it's rather an argument related to error cancellation, to be fair. Newer versions of this theory see the market as an information aggregation device. Scott Page was the first to point out that this is an insufficient model and that what is really at play here isn't just differences in exposure to information, but differences in people's cognitive maps, which he called perspectives, and differences in the algorithms or procedures that they apply to those maps. A colorful demonstration of a, of a simple prediction, Marcus, was Francis Skelton's Parable of the Ox. In 1906, Sir Francis Skelton observed a weight-guessing competition at a country, country, country fair, wherein 800 people entered into a competition to guess the weight of an ox, which was displayed at the center of the marketplace. The ox was. Skelton discovered that while the average guess 1,197 pounds was extremely close to the actual weight, which is 1,198 pounds of the ox. The difference between the best individual guess and the true weight was much larger. So the crowd beat the experts. More recently, University of Washington 2013 used crowds to map the structure of an AIDS-related virus that had perplexed experts for more than a decade. This was the first time that a large crowd of gamers solved a research problem that no small team of scientists has been able to solve. With respect to wisdom, well, people often like to call this cleverness that has been discovered to emerge from crowds under certain conditions. Scholars like to refer to this cleverness as collective wisdom or the wisdom of crowds, as is the title of one of those books. But in truth, thus far, only cleverness has been considered. And, and that book should be called The Cleverness or the intelligence of the crowd. Wisdom has scantily been considered in any holistic fashion, except by Amartya Sen on measurement, who merged some ideas about cleverness with ideas from the Bhagavad Gita, which is an in ancient Indian philosophical and spiritual text. Okay, Janis, this was really great. How, how can people reach out to you and eventually contribute to your project? So we have a website, um, the collectivize.com. And my email is uh, Johannes, uh, J-O-H-A-N-N-E-S, at collectivize.com. And the rest, you know, you can get my LinkedIn profile and uh, my GitHub profile on the show notes. Sounds great. So we will add all these things and also some references to uh, books and papers that you mentioned uh, during the episode. Janis, it was really great to have you here at datascienceatome.com. Thank you very much, Francesco. It was my pleasure. This episode is supported by CryptPad, the secure collaboration platform to edit your documents with colleagues and friends without compromising your privacy. No document can be read by the cloud or the NSA, not even CryptPad themselves. You can try it for free. For more, visit cryptpad.fr. C-R-Y-P-T-P-A-D dot F-R. Imagine an organization that wants to unlock the value of their data, but their data is too sensitive. Imagine a data scientist who wants to work on very rare data, but she cannot access them. With FitChain, organizations and individuals can unlock the value of their data instantly, connecting them to data scientists who have an incentive to work on a solution. No confidential information will ever leave the organization, which, thanks to FitChain, can keep their industrial secrets while enjoying the endless benefits of machine learning. But wait, there's more. Data owners can monetize their data. Data scientists can monetize their models. With a team of experts in AI and blockchain technology, FitChain allows highly regulated environments from domains like healthcare, research and development, and banking to take advantage of machine learning without compromising the thing we value most, confidentiality. Visit FitChain.io and unlock the value of your data. This was Data Science at Home the podcast that makes machine learning and artificial intelligence easy for everyone. If you like the show, don't forget to write a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podbean. You can also find us on datascienceathome.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and get the latest updates. Thanks for listening.
Hey, are you still there? Well, let me tell you about the newsletter of Data Science at Home. It's my free digest of the best content in artificial intelligence, data science, predictive analytics, and computer science. Subscribe now, datascienceathome.com.